Thousands of people died in London in 1854. Cholera was the killer. Cholera is a disease that kills within days. So there was this guy, Jon Snow, who walked around the Soho district of London, knocking from door to door to door. And he asked, has there been a death in the family? And he got an answer. Why, yes, my mother died yesterday. He went to the next house and he asked, ma'am, has there been a death in the family? And he got an answer. No, not here, but up the street at 64 Lexington, a little girl died two days ago. He took all these deaths and he put them up on a map. These little black lines here show us what he actually saw. I've exaggerated this data so you can actually see it a little better on this screen. Jon Snow had a sneaking suspicion that the water pump was the reason for the transport of cholera. Do you guys notice anything particular about this data? When I layer over where the pumps were in the city, it becomes very obvious at the corner of Broad and Lexington, this pump was to blame. Jon Snow figured this out, and they call him the father of modern day epidemiology, the study of how health and disease moves throughout a city. Now what Jon Snow did is great. I think it's awesome. However, it is not scalable, right? Think about how many pumps there are around the world, how many wells there are, and how many people are affected by disease and illness from this water. You would need to hire millions, if not billions, of Jon Snows, and they would need to knock on all of these doors every single day. He would need to ask, is there a disease? Is there an illness? Has there been a death? Water testing today is reactive. We need to make it proactive. We're trying to find solutions for water, but we don't understand what the problem actually is. How can you find a solution if you don't understand the problem space? I've made it my life's goal to figure out what this problem is. Let's have a conversation about how we can hack water and what the future of water is, about how we can build millions of Jon Snows and put them around the world. I used to work at a venture capital fund in India. Think like Shark Tank, but India, without the Mark Cuban. And the really cool thing about this venture capital fund is we only gave money to companies who were building products that focused on people or populations that earned less than $2 a day. And one really cool thing that I saw about this company was we saw a ton of business plans that came through the door. There was one in particular that sticks out. It was this company in South India that was actually developing a water filter, something that purifies our water. However, the only issue is, is it was way too expensive. It was not accessible to the population it was targeting. And what's even worse is when we went down to this geography, that they were looking to do their first deployment in, turns out there is a simple five cent solution that was a chlorine pill. Now I wanna get one thing straight. I am not for simple solutions. I do believe in long-term social development and let's figure out progress on how we can actually implement it properly. However, if your goal is to get people out of hospital beds, let's do the short-term solution first. Figure out what the problem is and then build a solution around that. This got me really interested in water. And so I started doing a ton of research. And I figured out here in the US, about 70% of our water is primarily used for energy generation and agriculture. The rest of it is used for stuff that we're used to, like taking a shower, washing our hands, and drinking water. But one really interesting thing that I learned is that water is different for each application you use it for. And what I mean by this is for agriculture, or for drinking water, or for your swimming pool. Right, let's take a swimming pool for example. If you were to go to your swimming pool, you would need to measure the water. Right, you'd go to your backyard and you'd say the chlorine is low. This is how you understand what the data is. And after you understand that the chlorine is low, let's say it needs to be up to five parts per million or ppm, and you're down to one, you add chlorine, you fix the water. This loop is different for everything. 
right? So you wouldn't take this swimming pool water and put it into your tap to drink. You wouldn't take the swimming pool water and let's say, for example, you're brewing beer, right? Water is a really big part of brewing beer. You don't want your swimming pool water to brew that beer. And the really cool thing that I figured out is that there's a bunch of these little, little small loops everywhere you go. And after looking at it, there's one thing that I really want to get across, is that water is different. It comes in different shapes and different flavors and different sizes. You can think about it as like a big control board, right? You have all these levers, triggers, and switches. And if you have a swimming pool, you're going to increase the chlorine. If you have an agriculture, you're going to increase the nitrates. You may add levers, you may subtract levers. This picture over here is of the Olympics in Rio. The green pool on the side, it doesn't look so good. Right? It was a loop, it was a measure, understand, fixed loop that was not managed properly. The chlorine was low, which ended up causing algae to grow, thus causing a green pool. All this talk about pools, by the way, I actually used to be a pool boy. <laughs> down, down in Southern California, my parents used to own a chain of pool and spa supply stores. And by the way, I look absolutely amazing in some like, little short, you know, lifeguard <laughs> red shorts. I still remember riding around in the pickup truck. We would go from house to house, like a pool boy does, and they would take a test of the water, take the little four drops, if any of you have ever tested a pool before. You look at the pH, you look at the chlorine, I would figure out this is what it needs, and you would put the chlorine in to give a safe environment for these homeowners to swim in. Fast forward a few years, my company up in San Francisco, we had this idea, why don't we automate this process? Why don't we build a robot, in a sense, a John Snow, that can automatically measure the pool chemistry, tell you what your chemicals are, and then you go ahead and put it in. And we built just that. We have a little floating robot, Wi-Fi connected, have your app, tells you what chemicals to put in, and if you don't have them, we use your Amazon Prime credit card, get it delivered to your house the next day. And we looked at it and we said, there is more to water than just pools, right? These loops exist everywhere. How do we take this, this robot that we built and deploy it around the world so we don't have problems like Jon Snow did in London. Right? How, do we, how do we get massive deployment of these robots? And when we started looking at this, we realized that because of these little measure, understand, fix loops, you need to have a library of understanding of if this water is going to be used for a swimming pool, you need to put chlorine. Here's the equations that go with that. If you need to use this water for agriculture, you need to put more nitrates. Here's the equation that goes with that. What you end up building is this library or this instruction book of all of these little mini instructions of how you're gonna use the water that's coming in for the purpose you need to use it for. Just like the human genome, what if we had built the water genome? And when we asked this question, we started looking at where water is a problem around the world. Is it just Jon Snow? Is it this isolated incident in London? Or does it happen around the world? And so there's three stories I want to talk about today of how this genome and this robotics platform can change the way that we look at water. The first, let's go to Flint, Michigan. In Flint, they moved the water source to the Flint River. And this chemical cocktail inside of this new water source was slightly different than what they were actually getting their water from. As this water percolated through the piping and ended up into the houses, turn on your tap, pour yourself a glass of water, what ended up happening is this cocktail activated lead in the pipes in a particular area. You now have lead in your water. Thousands of children have unsafe levels of lead in them right now. By the way, this is in 2012, not in 1854. Second place I want to take you to is Kenya. The World Health Organization says that water and water-related diseases are the largest killer in the world, outside of wars, outside of terrorism. Waterborne illnesses are a serious thing. And people travel miles to go get their water. Right? What if we could take this robotics platform with the water genome and deploy them at a well in, say, Kenya, or in Nigeria, or in India, or heck, hey, here in Flint? What if the thing measured the chemistry at the well and we sent a text message to the, to the village head. We said, hey, well number 364 has an issue. Do not drink from that well. Better yet, we sent the message to a nonprofit 
that is maybe managing that well. This well needs more chemicals. Now I take you here close to home in the Salinas Valley. Water is a lifeblood for people here in the valley and for any agrarian community. I was actually talking to a daughter of a farmer the other day, and I want for one second all of us to abstract ourselves of what we think water is. Take yourself away from the shower, from the tap, from the swimming pool. Water pays this girl's ballerina classes. It pays for her college tuition. Now imagine what the drought did to the farmers here. And as this drought affected the farmers in the valley, they had to dig deeper and deeper and deeper underground in search for water. Right? They still need to grow, still need to feed the U.S. And as the water came out, they had to over-fertilize, right? They have to make up for the nutrients in the well. And as they over-fertilized, they planted the crops. This water ended up going into runoff. And now they've over-fertilized this water that's going back into the groundwater. They're polluting these ground wells. What if we could take this robotics platform, coupled with the genome project, put it at the input water source? We know what the water chemistry is coming out. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Farmer, add this particular fertilizer. And after it comes off of the runoff, let's take a look at it. If it's too polluted to go into the ground, we'll stop it and put it somewhere else. Everything I said just touches the tip of the iceberg. We need a better understanding of water because we cannot live without it. The next time you open up your tap, just understand. When you look at that glass of water being filled up, water is more than just water. Join the revolution. There's plenty of room for all of us. Thank you.